Hey guys, girls, aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, welcome to another Biz Loan Consultants video. My name is Buzz Glover, I'm the Managing Director and Founder of Biz Loan Consultants. And I thought I'd just give you a quick introduction to an interview that I did with one of my students this past week. His name is Bill King, he's with Four Kings Capital. And he is a former, I believe, a 2018 BLC student. Um, Bill and I were talking on a phone call last week. Uh, we're talking about some things that were going on in his brokerage business. And at some point in that conversation, I said, boy, Bill, I wish I had this uh, conversation uh, on tape because there's a lot of good things my other students could learn from it because we were just going through a number of uh, various items that uh, uh, he was having. He had questions on and actually was commenting on on some of the successes he had and so forth. So in that conversation, I asked him, Bill, do you mind if I interview you and maybe we can recreate that the best of our ability? So, what, uh, what, but before I get started, I thought maybe what I could do is just give you some of the takeaways that I had from the interview as I was going through it and editing, edit, editing the video. Uh, one is both Bill and I have similar paths for getting started as a brokerage, him more as a banker, myself more as a successful salesperson. Um, Although we get into that a little bit in the video that um, you know, we both agreed that, uh, you know, this type of business is more prone to successful salespeople. It's, uh, it's great for people who have a lot of relationships. And uh, without me stealing his thunder, there's a, there is a similar path to both of us getting started in our brokerages. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit couple of the other things that he talks about that I thought were fantastic and by the way this is one of the better videos that I think um, uh, better interviews that I've done and I think there's more you could take away from this interview than a lot of them so um, keep that in mind as you go through it but he gets into the five C's of credit uh, he gets into how the balance between keeping your pipeline full while trying to get deals funded so uh, that came up in our conversation last week where uh, in the beginning, most of your time is going to be spent trying to find business to fund. And then as the pipeline starts to get full, then you're going to be spending a lot of time on the back end trying to get the deals you have in-house funded. So and there's a balance between them. He, he was kind enough to talk about some of the commissions he has earned so far. Uh, please note that um, the, my earnings disclaimer, my, my goal is not to send anybody down a road uh, a um, – what do you call it, a get-rich-quick scheme. So, uh, But he, like I said, he was kind enough to talk about some of the commissions he's earned so far in his brokerage, and I appreciate that. Um, he, we talk a little bit about how long the sales cycle is for certain types of deals. Uh, they're typically longer in commercial real estate than they are in equipment finance, and we talk a little bit about that. And um, as I mentioned earlier, how commercial bank banking is really a business-to-business sales-type position. Um, the other thing he gets into, how you can use different products to meet your customer needs. Uh, there, there are sometimes you go into a customer looking for one product and you might recommend another one that makes sense for them and, or tweak the deal in a way that a funding source will be more amenable to getting it done. So he gets into a lot of that type of information. And lastly, he talks about finding the funding source's sweet spot, which you're going to hear a lot in this business, you know, what's the sweet spot of this bank or of this funding source, and what his process was or is for choosing, funder, f for choosing funding sources, which I think was a really excellent point. I, I went for years doing this all wrong, and he has it down to an art right from the beginning. So without further ado, I'm going to let Bill um, just jump in. Oh, by the way, the video and the audio is not up to snuff, especially on my end. I, I made the mistake of going down to my what I call my happy place down on my boat to film this. It was in the evening, and it continued to get darker, so the lighting, it almost looks like a Halloween-type video, but I decided to leave it in anyways because the content was so good. So at least on my end, when I'm speaking, to kind of just listen to me and um, – on Bill's end, his lighting is pretty good, and, and, his, and bo both of our audio is pretty good, although it does cut out every once in a while because of the internet connection down uh, on my boat. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you to uh, Bill King 
and our, the interview that was uh, recorded in September of 2019. Thanks for having me, Buzz. Um, I've been, before getting into this business, I spent 20 years in commercial banking. Um, started like many people with the bigger banks, um, spent probably four or five years with uh, larger banks and worked my way into a more of a regional type bank and always focusing on small to mid-sized businesses. And my frustration in all my banking career was that I was tired of being limited by the credit box of, of each bank that I worked for and had looked at one time several years ago into doing brokering in between jobs and did it briefly, but my family was young. I wasn't ready at that time. And then a few years ago, um, I looked at it again, and we started this company for Kings Capital, um, put my wife in charge of it, and I continued my job as a banker. And I was president of a small bank most recently and just decided that it was time to make the move full time. And it's been probably five months that I've been doing this full time now, and it's really been a great move for us. Uh, interesting that uh, you got started almost identically to the way I got uh, got started, and you mentioned the credit, the tight credit box, and maybe for those who are just getting started or who are looking at the business, maybe you can explain what that that means. I know exactly what you what you mean and how frustrating it can be when you're working for a bank and you're bringing business in, and and uh, I'll let you kind of explain it from there. Sure. Um, when you're looking at commercial banking, I, I like to look at what's called the five C's of credit. You know, I, I look at it in the shape of a box. You've got your cash flow, you've got your collateral, you've got the capital of the of the business or the owner, you've got the character and also the credit score of the owner. And last thing is the conditions of the industry, conditions of the bank, you know, different aspects that you really can't control. And depending on the bank you work for, a bank's going to have an appetite for a certain type of credit box. So for example, when I was with a small bank in Oklahoma, we had a period of time that we were lent up completely in hospitality. So I don't care how good your deal is, you were not getting a hotel motel deal through that, through that bank, at least for probably six months to a year. So that would be more of what I consider a condition limitation to where that bank was not interested in that credit type. And then so you look for alternate financing sources. And it seemed like every bank that I worked for, I would find good deals that didn't fit that bank's portfolio, but I could find other places to send it because I have a lot of contacts in lending. So I was already kind of brokering that I would send deals out to people, but I wasn't making any money doing it. Um, uh, the um... What are some of the bigger challenges that you've experienced since you've gone out on your own? Because when we were talking last week and the, um, what, what, uh, the whole idea for this meeting, we we're talking about various things that were going on in your business. And I think you had mentioned to me that your, your pipeline was getting pretty full and uh, you felt like, hey, I might need to spend more time working on getting the deals funded versus going out and finding more business, which is exactly what happened to me when I first started my business. I was, it was almost like a seesaw. You know, you would go out, find a bunch of business, and then you'd have a, a nice full pipeline, and then you'd work on that business. The next thing you know, you weren't marketing enough to, to bring more business in. But maybe you could explain um, maybe that, that situation and then any other type of challenges that you've um, encountered over the last, um, you know, since you started. Sure. Well, initially, of course, you're, you're priming the pump. You're getting out there, letting people know what you're doing. And fortunately, I have a lot of contacts in banking. And so I was getting out there talking to commercial realtors, bankers, people that I know in the community, and I got a little bit of deal flow. So the first challenge was sorting out deals quickly and figuring out when a deal was not bankable because it's, it's not hard to find a deal of someone who needs money it's sometimes hard to find a deal that is just outside of the parameters of the bank, but still you can find a home for it. So that was the first challenge was balancing that out and matching the right lenders up with the right deal. And I've run into a lot of SBA guaranteed loans because I have a background in SBA. I used to run an SBA team. 
So because of that, that's a good part of my, my current pipeline. I've also done a couple of land deals. I recently did a bridge loan for a commercial office building. I did a deal for a home builder that just needed more of a, a banking line of credit. And he was just with a bank that was too restrictive. So I took him to another banker I knew that was a little stronger. And what I would say some of the biggest challenges I'm having now is first, keep in mind that we don't get paid until we're funded when everything's done. So it's a little different than when you're a banker working for a paycheck and you're consistent every week. And the other thing is that I'm one step removed in the process to where I'm used to being the banker that's in-house, dealing with the credit committee, dealing with everybody. And now I have to depend on the banker that's in the bank to do that for me. So what I've had to do is do a better job of my write-up so that I can work past them, that the person reading the document will know the credit as well as I do, even if the person in between us isn't that great. Yeah, it makes complete sense. And that's the importance of having a good write-up and what I always call knowing the deal. And I guess what you're telling me, and I, I think it's pretty common and it's frustrating for, as a broker, is, is sometimes the guy that's out trying to sell the deal to the credit committee can't do as good a job as that as you could when you you were used to that all the years that you were in kind of inside that that circle so uh yeah that's awesome uh without getting like personal like what some of the commissions that you've earned i mean with four four figure you know five figure commissions um, is it kind of what you expected or it's been good so far the some of the smaller deals that i've done i've made a couple about twenty five hundred dollar flat fee and on the larger bridge loan that I did recently, that was a good um, twenty, thirty thousand dollar commission. Now I had to pay some referral fees out of that, but still the net to our business was pretty good. It was a good shot in the arm for us. Absolutely. And um, from maybe from the time that the deal was brought to you to the time it closed, how 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 much time passed? That one was pretty quick for a real estate deal. We probably did it in four to six weeks. And that included the appraisal time okay. and everything. Awesome. And that's not common. I'm, I'm doing, like I said, I have a lot of SBA deals and the cycle time on those are very long, but the payoff can be good when you get to the end. And I generally am not doing any SBA deals under 250, probably not under 350. And I'm pretty tough when I pre-screen those. I got you. So you don't want uh, what I call the time wasters. You don't you don't want to be spending a bunch of time on a deal that you know is never going to get funded. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I'll tell you that I'm very uh, careful about is one of my first questions whenever I talk to a potential referral source or I talk to a client is I want to understand the history of the deal. Where did it start? You know, if they're not dealing with their primary bank. Why didn't they go to their primary bank? And usually you'll start to find out, well, I tried my banker there and this happened. Okay. And then you went somewhere else and something probably happened there. So it's kind of like peeling an onion. A lot of times they won't tell you right out of the gate what happened, but I'm pretty good at finding out. And I'm pretty honest with people. I'll say, look, the more I understand what you've already found out, what's wrong with this deal, the better chance I'm going to have of mitigating that and, and finding a way to get it approved. You know, I used to train my, my salespeople. I would say I would arm them for loan committing. I would address whatever the weaknesses are, recognize them, and mitigate them. And if you can't mitigate the weakness, then you're probably not going to be able to get it approved. Gotcha. It's interesting that you mentioned your, the, the, the bankers that were underneath you because that was my next question. And I think uh, months ago when we talked, you had mentioned that you know and I know that really banking is more of a sales position than it is finance. I mean, the, the, the successful guys are the guys out who are, are, are who have a lot of relationships that um, know the players in the various industries they're going after. Uh, but may, maybe you can expand on that because it's because it was interesting to me because a lot of people, even, even my background, like I said, I was pretty good at sales and I, and that's one of the reasons the bank recruited me. Um, but I had, you know, I had to learn finance from like a, a three, four week crash course when I, the first bank that hired me. Um, so you mentioned you had to, had to 
train your salespeople, but really they were bankers, correct? Yes. You know, I call them salespeople because that's what I consider anyone in commercial banking is really your a type of business to business salesperson and you're selling in essence a commoditized service. You're selling money, you're selling treasury management services, you're selling yourself really as a as a banker, as a consultant. So one of the things that I train my bankers on is just to understand the credit. Like you said, know your deal, figure out what the strengths are, um, figure out what the weaknesses are, and figure out once you have those, you know, why do you think there's still a way to put a deal together? And the finance side, I think it's important to understand it just enough to have an intelligent conversation with a credit person that they know what you're talking about. But at the end of the day, it's really a sales business, both selling to the community and to potential clients, but also selling the deal internally to the potential lending sources. Yeah, it's right on. Um, I, and I know that I, cause I, I'm looking down through a, uh, a, a complete transparency. I'm looking down through some of the questions that I sent you earlier today and, uh, and I know we talked a little, you've, you've, you've talked a little bit about this already, but what are some of the niches that you, you go after? You're obviously SBA, you're, you're strong in that because you have a background in it. Uh, you, are there certain types of, um, of uh, industries that you're going after versus different types of products that, uh, banking products that you can sell outside of say SBA or, or, or is SBA kind of what your kind of uh, uh, meat and potatoes is? What I've done is because I'm fortunate to have a background in credit and a background in banking, I've kind of made my approach to just find deals that, you know, need help for, for some reason. They're either not bankable or they're not being taken care of. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I focus on deals probably from 500,000 to 5 million is my real sweet spot. And then I'll go down to 250 <clears throat> and maybe up to 10 million. And the reason why I focus in that space is because particularly here in the Dallas area, I think in that market, it's a little underserved or you're dealing with bankers that maybe are not all that well versed that may not know credit as well as they need to. So they're getting deals turned away that are actually good deals. They're just not packaging them correctly. So I feel that in that space, 500,000 to 5 million, that I can find enough opportunities there to keep myself pretty busy. And as far as a product type, I try to focus more on operating businesses because when you're working with actual businesses, then you have an opportunity for factoring if there's a working capital component. You have an opportunity for equipment finance, as you and I have talked about. And of course, if they're um, leasing a building and they want to buy a building, you have a, a real estate opportunity. So that's really where I focus. But again, I did a deal the other day that was um, a bridge loan for a commercial real estate investor. And that was a nice deal for us, but that's not probably my, my primary focus, but it's something that I have resources for. Gotcha. So you might go out and find a deal that you think's going to go one way and then all of a sudden when you get into the credit you start saying hey well you know i can't i can't write a permanent loan or a tr what i like to call commercial uh, a traditional commercial uh permanent loan i this guy needs a bridge loan until we can get that permanent loan and and you have the expertise and and the knowledge to say hey this isn't the right product for you i'm going to take you into this product and buy us some time for that for the product that you're going to end up in. Exactly. I mean, gotcha. that deal, just to give you some background ahead, on it, it's a commercial office building, probably about 15,000 square feet, give or take. And it was 40% occupied. And they had new tenants that were going to lease it up, but they had to do leasehold improvements in order to get the tenants in. But it was kind of the chicken or the egg for your traditional bank. Your historical rents are not sufficient for the cash flow but you can't get additional rents until you do the tenant finish out. So what I did was a bridge loan with a hard money lender that's giving us 12 months to get the finish out done, get the tenants in, get it stabilized. And I'm already talking to regular banks who will take us out once everything's in place. That's fantastic. Really nice. Good, good work. Um, we, and I know we've, once again, there's a lot of crossover from what I'm asking you, what's on my list here of questions versus uh, uh, what we've already talked about. But, uh, 
you mentioned about packaging the deal and knowing the deal. What are some of the things that are kind of like, you, you, you know, you're doing a, a say a $500,000 deal. You know, you need a full um, financial package. I mean, there's some things that are standouts right off the bat, but what are, what are some of the things that you would ask a client for when you're trying to get his, his uh, financial package together to present to a funding source? Sure. I like to use a checklist and I'll ask for three years business and personal tax returns. I'll get a current personal financial statement. If there's something changing in the business, like let's say they're, they're moving from a lease space into buying a space, or let's say there's going to be something significantly different in the future than historically, then I'll try to put together some projections or a business plan. But if if that's not needed, we don't necessarily have to get that. I try to get a good bio and background on the business owners and the management. So because I think that, you know, that saying that, you know, stories, stories sell, you know, and if you know the whole story of the business, kind of where they came from, where they're going, it's easier to explain the credit and get buy-in from potential lenders. And then once I have a complete packet together, and once I get a feel of kind of where I think the strengths and the weaknesses are, then I'll look through my database and I'll pick the top three lenders that I think would go for this deal based off of deal type, strengths and weaknesses, size of credit, appetite of the lenders, and I'll start stopping it. And usually I'll do a summary sheet that I kind of hit the highlights of the credit. And I'll sometimes just put it in an email or I'll do it as an attachment and I'll send it to myself and I'll blind carbon the people that I'm sending it to. And then I'll just send it out to my top three or four lenders and I'll tell them, this is a, this is what we're looking for. This is a competitive deal. And they, all my lenders I'm very transparent with. And I tell them, look, it's my responsibility as a consultant for my client to give them multiple options. So the fact that I'm talking to you, you're already one of the top two or three, but understand there's two others. And I feel like I, if I'm disclosing that to them, I'm being fair, even though these are people that I kind of know and I'm kind of friends with. They understand that, you know, I'm going to give them a fair shake, but I'm not going to just get one one lender for the borrower. Oh, that's fantastic. And what, what a, a great way to frame it that you're being transparent with them. It's kind of interesting because I reflect back and keep in mind that most of my uh, professional experience was in equipment finance and I didn't and it's kind of funny when I reflect back when I first got started as a broker in 1999 2000 I'm, I'm kind of dating myself here but um, I would I, I would shotgun deals which is terrible because it, it was for everybody involved and it took me a long time and I think it took one banker to kind of tell me off uh, because I was I, I wasn't transparent I was sending the deal out to everybody. I didn't know any better. better. And then I think a couple of the banks after, because I was generating a, a ton of business, I, I think one banker called me out finally and said, hey, you know, you sent us 10 deals and you, and you didn't really even follow up on them. You know, so there was no relationship building on the funding source side. So that's that's fantastic, the, the, the kind of the, um, the process that you're using when you're deciding on what – uh, funding source that you you want to use. Um, if you were to give any advice to a new broker, and I realize that you're relatively new out on your own, but you've had years of banking experience. I mean, what would be some of the advice that you give to a new broker? I would say two things that I would tell a new broker. One I'd mentioned earlier is be sure you get as as clear of a picture of of the credit as you can, because my experience with with bankers has been if you tell them what the weaknesses are up front, they almost want to help you find a mitigating factor. But if they have to go and find the weakness themselves, they feel like you're hiding something from them. So to me, that's very important. And one of the things that I like to do is, for example, I had a deal last week. We got turned down on a $3.5 million SBA loan on Tuesday from one of my lenders that, and I quote, told me he had a 95% chance of getting this deal through. And I guess we fell in the 5% that oh, just didn't happen. But by later that day, I had an appointment with us with another banker on Thursday that was very interested in the deal. And I already did a new write-up where I took 
into consideration what I learned from the process with the first broker, first um, lender, seeing what their underwriters said, the weaknesses they identified, and I incorporated that into my new write-up, which then showed that weakness up front, but explained why we were still okay with it. And as we're working with this new batch of lenders, they're not as concerned about the weakness as a previous lender was. And I think part of it is because we're bringing it out up front. So what I would say is, you know, get turned down quickly. You know, I joke with my clients about that. I say one of the biggest advantages of me being a broker versus a borrower going directly to a bank is that they're going to turn me down quickly as a broker because they're, they don't have to go through all the fairness and lending stuff that they would if you walked in as a business applicant. Where as a banker, you have to accept the business application. You can't discourage a small business in any way. There's all, all sorts of regulations. But if I'm as a broker calling and I say I have a deal, this is kind of the, the layout of it, they could tell me, yeah, I don't think we're going to get there on that. So I get shot down three, four times within the course of an hour before I find someone who I think is going to be a good candidate. So that's one thing I would say, you know, get turned down quickly. And then when you're dealing with your lending sources, find out what their, their sweet spot is. Find out what types of deals they're hungry for. You know, most lenders are going to give you a BS answer when you ask them what type of deals they like. They're going to say, oh, well, you know, we'll do anything. We'll do this. We'll do that. So then I'll drill down a little further and say, okay, what does the perfect client look like for you? Find out like what industries that they're attracted to, what they're, what deal size they're drawn to. And so you can know, dial in for each lender. You can send them other deals, but you know kind of where their sweet spot is. And then keep a good database of your different lenders. The way that I look at it is everybody has a credit box. So now instead of being limited by one credit box, I've got multiple boxes that I have access to. And it's just a matter of matching the borrower up with the right one. Wow, perfect. That's, uh, I couldn't have explained it any better. Uh, although, I, you know, it's kind of funny because you mentioned your ability and the um, reason for the decline and then massage that information for the next uh, bank that you take it to. And it was interesting. And I think this is somewhat unique to equipment finance, which I realize is probably a smaller part of your business than it was for me. Uh, but I used to have, and I, and I, I mentioned this quite a bit in a lot of my, um, my training videos. Um, I used to have like a go-to bank because I didn't, I didn't have the banker mentality that you had. I had more of the sales guy that let's just, let's just get as many deals through the pipeline as can. And we'll just win through sheer numbers, you know, <laughs> which is not probably the best way to run your business. But I ran it that way for years cause I didn't know any better. Um, but I do remember having like a go-to bank. It, you have, I mean, it sounds to me maybe you have three go-to banks or four go-to banks that are probably in the forefront of your mind. And then after that, then that's kind of where you get to start getting creative and digging deeper into your database to match that uh, lender or that um, uh, borrower to, the, to whatever lender you have in your database. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, what I try to do is I ha try to have a go-to bank and a backup for each segment as best as I can. So, for example, if I'm going to look at an SBA deal that's going to be for a startup business, I've got two lenders that I know off the top of my head would look at that deal, and I have a bunch that wouldn't. But if I had a, a ground-up construction deal that was going to maybe require an SBA guarantee, I've, all I've got a database of other lenders that I would talk to. Or if I had just a conventional banking deal that was going to be what I call a CNI credit for an operating business, let's say a $3 million deal, I've got two bankers in that segment that I would consider. So I try to have multiple go-to people depending on the credit. Well, that's fantastic. Really great information. And uh, Bill, I think we kind of did the best we could on kind of simulating this, the, the, a very similar conversation that we had last week when we weren't recording it. So I, I appreciate you kind of uh, allowing me to get a little a more formalized version of that conversation. Uh, before we close, um, if there's any way that you can promote your business, I know uh, Bill King from Four Kings Capital, by the way, I love the name. I also love the, the newsletter uh, that, you're, that you send out each month. That stick with it. I think in the long run, it's going to um, – Keep, keep your name in front of the uh, various referral sources and, 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 you, and or borrowers that you're contacting. So, uh, but yeah, any, anything that you want to talk about your business and kind of uh, how maybe how someone can reach you, 
uh, be glad to put it out there for you. Great. No, thank you. Um, sometimes I do like to work with other brokers. I mean, we're all trying to help each other out. Sometimes there's opportunities that I may be a resource on. Um, best way to get me is you can go to our website, which is uh, fourkingscapital.com. That's the number four, K-I-N-G-S capital.com. Or you can also email me. It's just bill at four kings capital. Or you can contact me um, on my cell phone is 580-583-1017. And one thing I'll tell your listeners, though, is I'm not going to be a great resource on deals under 250. I might be able to help direct traffic or give you some suggestions. And I'm also not a big fan of broker chains. If you have a deal that was referred to you by another broker or by another broker and you're like the third broker to look at it, the only way that I'm going to help out in a case like that is there's only going to be me and one other broker involved. So that's one thing that I, I just do not do. I don't do broker chains. Completely understandable. A matter of fact, I, I don't even like co-brokering deals. I mean, we can both kind of be forthright in that area. Uh, although I get people asking me to, to do it all the time. I just, one, one of the reasons I don't like doing it is because I don't, know that I could give the amount of time that some deals re are required. And I think a lot of brokers, by the time they invite another broker in, they've kind of given up on the deal, which is kind of bad for everybody involved because it's like, okay, I've given up on it. Let me just see if you can get it done. And that's probably not the way you should go about it. So, <laughs> but uh, really, really, yeah, really, really good stuff, Bill. I appreciate it. I, I love that uh, you're a student of mine. I feel like I learn a lot off of you as well. And um I hope that uh, you uh, have continued success. I apologize for what I think is not the greatest internet connection, but I think the we'll be able to pull this off at some level. And I, I see that the lighting in my boat is terrible as well, so I have to, <laughs> I have to rethink what, what I'm going to show on this video. But uh, I thank you, and I will make sure that once I get this thing up and, and ready for publishing that I'll reach out to you and, and uh, let you know what's going on. All right? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Buzz. And also, if you can send me a copy of this, I'd like to see it too. Oh, absolutely, Bill. Appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll be talking real soon as okay. we normally do. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Buzz.